Good evening. It gives me immense pleasure to extend to you all a very warm greetings on behalf of the Society of Naval Architecture Students. The Society of Naval Architecture Students is a student body of Department of Ship Technology. It is responsible for nurturing young naval architects by organizing various events like this. Now, it is my honor to invite midshipman Animesh Panda from 44th Batch to lead us to the webinar on the topic, an introduction to warship design and its takeaways for beginners. Am I audible? Okay. So very good evening to one and all present here. Those who are attending this live stream, those who are present offline. So I'm Midshipman Animesh Panda from the 44th batch. And uh, I'll be giving a very brief overview on how a warship design is to be approached. So I'll be covering various aspects as to why warship design is a bit different from the conventional approach that we follow for the design of conventional marine vessels. So uh, it's uh, totally based on what I have appreciated till now, uh, studying naval architecture for the past four years, and what I have uh, studied and read about from various sources. So I'll be covering all those things in this uh, seminar. So can we have the presentation? Okay, that's it. So I would like to urge you all to feel free to speak up whenever you feel like uh, you are not able to understand or appreciate any particular thing that I'm speaking or any single thing that is written on the screen, you can uh, speak up same time, I would be happy to address your doubts. So uh, let's start, we'll begin. Okay, finally we can start now. Okay, good. So uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate the fact that you all have joined this seminar because uh, this topic is very interesting for me. Being from the naval background, this topic is particularly very interesting for me and uh, I'm very sure that by the end, end of this webinar, we, you will also be able to appreciate why uh, we need to uh, know about this topic. So it is a very uh, basic introduction to warship design and it's takeaway for beginners like you guys. I was there four years back, so I can understand how you feel when you uh, listen to such a topic. So this will be the scope of the presentation today. Uh, we'll cover introduction, the roles of a warship, the approach for designing a warship, the weapons package, uh, naval architectural considerations, stealth, propulsion, safety, And here's a slideshow. Okay, so sorry for the inconvenience. So we'll be covering all these topics today in the webinar. So it is a very systematic approach. Uh, so it will make it very easy for you guys to understand what I'm going to put forward to you. So coming to the introduction part, uh, it, it is a completely uh, from the point of view of a beginner. So you will be able to understand it very easily. I will not be talking about any uh, rocket science, which you will not be able to appreciate. So, uh, first we need to know what is a warship. A warship in itself is a weapon system. We generally say that weapons are installed on a warship, but the warship as a whole is a single in entity and it, uh, the warship is in itself a weapon system and its guns and missiles provide the firepower. So the ship is the single thing that, that ensures that the weapons are to be deployed effectively. Now, why we need to study this topic, I've already mentioned before, 
the design approach of warships is completely different it begins with the weapons package now conventionally whenever we are going to design any ship we start off with the approach which talks about the volume volume based approach or the weight based approach but for designing a warship we need to start off by knowing what mission it is going to perform what are the main weapons that the ship is going to carry so that is the main starting point for that design of a warship so again why this topic because uh the weapons package or the payload of the warship is never fixed it is completely different it varies with the mission profile no two warships in the world even sister ships cannot have same weapon package so the payload is completely uh different for each ship that's why designing each vessel is a huge task in itself now uh, normally when we are going to design any normal merchant vessel or uh, any conventional vessels there are a set of rules classification society rules so we can follow them we can refer to them whenever uh, there is any discrepancy and it is a standard operating procedure to follow such kind of rules but for warship design such kind of rules do not uh, apply in a general basis we need to have a separate standard of rules and for every nation every navy every country a different set of rules are there so uh, obviously you will not be sharing your data with another country so the rules are very confidential and they are restricted to a particular navy that's why because we are not able to share the databases too much because of that reason these rules are a bit more complex than the conventional classification society rules that we have now uh, normally the merchant vessels they do not need to have this added uh, factor of stealth warships cannot paint a huge bullseye in the radars of the enemy and expect them to be uh, safe so we need to protect our ship from being detected by the enemy that's why we need to design our ship in a stealthy manner so this added factor of stealth is a very huge factor when it comes to ship design i'll be covering that in a later part and uh, ships obviously indeed have to go in harm's way they have to go into the war zone so they are more prone to damage as compared to normal vessels that's why uh, they are more more vulnerable to damage and uh, there is no constant speed no fixed speed in which a warship operates a normal uh, oil tanker or a bulk carrier bulk carrier you say it can operate at a cruising speed from port a to port b but a warship for a warship the concept of cruising is restricted so you can cruise only during normal operations when you are operating sonar you have to operate at a very low speed when you are in a war zone you have to either escape the enemy or you have to chase the enemy so you have to sprint so you have to vary your speed constantly because of that reason designing a warship designing a single hull a single ship for all these ranges is very difficult now uh, when we design a warship we generally build a warship to serve for around 30 25 to 30 years but the weapons installed in that warship may get obsolete after just 5 or 10 years so we need to design our warship aiming at uh, uh, at in such a manner that even if the weapon package changes we are able to include those changes in our warship even if a new weapon comes up after 5 or 10 years i am able to incorporate that weapon in my warship so uh, what are the roles of a surface warship we need to be very clear about what is the role that we are going to assign our warship so that we can design it in a suitable manner so warships are generally designed into two categories the first is combatants and the second one is auxiliaries so auxiliaries are all, the, all those vessels which do not fight they provide support like oil tankers survey vessels diving support vessels research vessels missile testing vessels etc combatants i'll be covering in the next section so each ship is built to perform a specific role when you are designing the ship you designate that ship to perform area air defense or anti submarine warfare or certain specific roles are uh, given to those ship so uh, we cannot just rely on any single role and we can expect that ship to go into the battle zone we have to uh, design that ship in such a manner that it can supplement other roles as well now uh, i'll be showing you some different types of warships so these are the most uh famously uh studied warships these are the aircraft carriers these are the largest warships a navy can have these are the capital ships of uh, any navy currently in this world uh, today's world only 14 navies are operating aircraft carriers and india can proudly boast of having two operational aircraft carriers as of now so aircraft carriers as the name suggests are mobile uh, platforms which can launch operate service aircraft fighter aircraft helicopters from them so it 
simply extends the range of your aircraft which could not have done all the uh, mission it is tasked to do when you operate it from land so it is basically extending the range of your fighter jets so next are uh, destroyers uh, so these vessels are generally aimed at achieving uh, superiority in all three domains that is surface warfare subsurface warfare and area air defense so it is a complete package it has all the missiles and uh, air defense systems you can dream of so uh, it is a complete package now frigates they are very much similar to destroyers but their size is little bit smaller than that of destroyers so frigates also have weapon systems which can act in all three domains of war next up is corvettes so corvettes are uh, again they are smaller than frigates corvettes are designated a specific role in any one of the dom in any one of the three domains so uh, this is a kamorta class corvette of the indian navy so this corvette is specifically designed for anti submarine warfare so this corvette is going to carry some special torpedoes some special anti submarine warfare rockets so a special uh, job has been assigned to this corvette next up we have uh, patrol vessels as the name suggests this ves these vessels are used for patrolling of the coastline so they need to be very fast so that they can respond to any threat that has been detected in the uh, friendly waters they are very lightly armed they need not be armed very heavily and they are very uh, smaller as compared to other vessels that i have shown till now next up we have amphibious vessels so amphibious vessels as the name suggests they mainly help us to deploy troops on land so it can carry large units of infantry it can also carry tanks trucks it can also carry uh, helicopters as you can see the uh, the helicopters that are placed on the deck it also has a bay to operate uh, landing craft utility or landing vessels which can take your troop from the ship to the beach and they can also ferry them back so these are amphibious ships so now uh, i will be talking about the approach for designing a warship so uh, commonly as we know we have two uh, most common approaches that is the weight based approach and volume based approach so the starting point of these two approaches is the weight or volume of the cargo that we are going to carry suppose you are going to design a bulk carrier or an uh, oil tanker you know how much you are going to carry so from that point you will start and then you will th the entire process will revolve around that thing but for warships it is uh, slightly different uh for warships uh, we do not have any established practices for conventional ships we have many empirical formulas many uh, established practices which can give us a good estimate of what my dimensions are going to be how my ship is going to perform so that i can approach my uh, uh concept design in a very systematic manner but for warships we do not have any because there are uh, so many types of warships and we do not have enough database to form any established practices so that we can estimate such factors for my warship next uh, uh, warship design completely revolves around the weapon package that the ship is going to carry so once i assign that my ship is going to carry guided missiles the entire design process will revolve around that thing where i am going to place my uh, cruise missiles how will they operate how much is the weight of the cruise missiles and what are the systems that we need to support the operation of cruise missiles so uh, some of you might have seen a conventional design spiral uh, for a conventional vessel but for uh, warships uh, this is a, a design spiral it has been taken for a book uh, named uh, surface warships by dr pj gates so you can see that the first point here is identifying the main weapons so once you have identified the main weapons you estimate the weight you do initial machinery proposal estimate the volume and then you proceed in a systematic manner so uh, such iterations are very uh, they are not accurate when it comes to warships because you have to change a lot of things during the course of the design you fix that uh, you are going to carry 16 number of um, uh, cruise missiles for your warship and when you start the design something happens some new uh, uh, staff requirements come and then you have to increase the number of missiles missiles that you had planned so the entire thing that you have done till now is of no use so you have to start again so this process is a very uh, highly complex one and you have to do multiple iterations before you can arrive at a single conclusion so coming to the weapons package weapons are designed to counter any threats on all the three domains that we have that is surface under the surface and on the air as well so for every action 
there is an equal and opposite reaction you must have heard similarly for every weapon there is a countermeasure if you are having a torpedo you have decoy systems for torpedoes if you are having any surface to surface missiles you are having missile defense systems if you are having any uh, airborne uh, any uh, air defense system you are having flare for that so for every weapon system there is a countermeasure so every weapon system has its own requirements you cannot just go on placing weapons randomly anywhere on your ship every weapon system has a arc of fire so you cannot expect a gun which is placed in the aft to counter any threat that is coming from the forward so you cannot club all your weapons in one place you have to look at the arc of fire what is the arc of fire of your weapon and then you have to place accordingly so that is one of the starting points of your concept design which generally during uh, general arrangement for conventional ships is uh, which comes at a later stage we have to uh, design all these things we have to take into consideration all these things at the first step itself so again we need power supply for operating those weapon systems uh, some weapon systems need to be uh, reloaded after they have been fired so we need to place some magazines uh, in close proximity to those weapon systems so that we can reload those weapon systems in the middle of the battle zone itself then there are sensors we cannot fire weapon systems in the blind we need to identify and locate the threats so for that we need uh, some sensor systems which are generally radars sonars etc so i'll be showing some weapon equipments that are uh, commonly fitted on board these are the main weapons there are some secondary weapons as well but the design revolves around the placement and inclusion of these main weapons only so these are some cruise missiles uh, these are the famously uh, known as brahmos cruise missiles these are the fastest cruise missiles in the world and uh, it was jointly developed by india and russia so these missile missiles are used to counter surface threats so suppose i detect any uh, hostile ship in my region i will be using these missiles to counter those threats so uh, next up are uh, the air defense missiles suppose i find any fighter jets or any helicopters hostile uh, airborne threats in my area these barak 8 missiles these are from israel and uh, jointly developed by india so these missiles can be used for air defense we also have torpedoes uh, obviously if there are submarines you cannot use missiles to counter submarine so you'll be having torpedoes and uh, asw rockets so these are torpedoes they can bo target both uh, ships and uh, submarines then there are conventional uh, main guns they are cannons which can be used to target surface targets which are in close ranges we can also use them to uh, counter airborne threats as well so now uh, i had spoken about the arcs of fire so it is very important for us to know uh, which weapon system is having which arc of fire how do how am i going to place them so uh, there is a system called as vertically launching silos where the missiles are stacked in a vertical fashion so that eliminates the problem of uh, deciding our placement on the basis of arc of fire because i'll be showing a video so uh, this is the firing of a brahmos missile from a vertically launching silo so what happens is the missile shoots up vertically and then it guides itself in whichever direction it is assigned to go and then it will proceed in that direction so we do not need to uh, worry about the arcs of fire can you play the video from just click once okay leave then so basically what happens is i hope you are able to understand the missile shoots up vertically and then it guides itself in the direction in whichever it is uh, desired to proceed in whichever direction we have assigned it to go in whichever direction the threat is then it will proceed in that same direction you can uh, just go to slide show okay so uh, radars are one of the most important sensor systems which we use to identify and detect the range and the direction of the hostile threats so radar stand for radio detection and ranging some of you might already know how these systems work so uh, 
radio waves are used uh, to find uh, for this radar systems radio waves are reflected from metal surfaces so we uh, periodically in a uh, uh, harmonical manner we release radio waves in the direction in which we think hostile threats might be there so the radio waves will travel in that direction if there is any metal uh, object there it will strike that surface and then it will come back so i will detect the same radio waves that i had emitted before and i will calculate the time it has taken so that i can get the direction and the range of the hostile threat so uh, after sensing the radio waves which has been reflected back from the uh, hostile surface we can find out that there is something uh, hostile suspicious going on in that particular region it can also give us the size of the uh, hostile target depending upon how much radio wave uh, what is the intensity of the radio waves that it is uh, reflecting back so uh, radars need to be placed on a high ground we cannot place them on the water line and expect them to have a range of 300 350 kilometers so generally whenever we are designing a warship radars are placed on the topmost point of the ship so uh, you must know that masts are the uh, tallest structures on the ships so generally radars are placed on the masts so uh, now we'll see how radars have evolved over the period of time so this is a world war 2 era japanese battleship and you can see a very bulky uh, kind of a mast a very heavy structure and on the top you can see radars there are multiple uh, masts in this ship and uh, since at that duration in that uh, time in that era uh, the crew of the ship largely depended on visual detection to find out where the enemy ship is so because of that reason we needed to place uh, lookouts uh, on these structures we also had targeting systems visual targeting systems which are placed on two different masts so that we can find out the range of the enemy target but over the period of years uh, visual detection has become completely relevant to us because no two hostile ships are going to come in visual range they are detected well beyond that they are detected even if they are in 50 60 kilometers of range they, uh, we can detect the hostile vessels so this is a very latest uh, japanese warship this is a uh, uh, so you can see that most of the there were multiple radars in the previous picture but all the sensors have been integrated and clubbed together in a single mast so now uh, the concept of placing multiple masts have been removed obviously if you are placing more uh, heavier structures uh, above the center of gravity so the center of gravity will move up and the stability of your ship will be compromised we do not want to uh, do that to us so because of that we have clubbed multiple sensors and multiple radars into one single structure and we are having integrated mast systems now but uh, still in this picture you can see that the bridge is different the mast is different the funnels are different so this might cause some problem when it comes to uh, deciding the stealth or the radar cross section of our vessel so another concept is the uh, integrated uh, mast system in which all funnel uh, bridge mast everything has been clubbed together into one system and there is no uh, question of uh, having a very large radar cross section this is the zumwalt class uh, destroyers from the us navy so uh, they are considered to be one of the most stealthiest warships in the uh, current world because their radar cross section is very less you can also see that all the weapon systems are covered here so uh, it is also having a inverted bow concept we'll come to that later so for detecting uh, threats on the surface and above the surface radar is enough but you cannot use radio waves below the surface of water because of high attenuation levels you can uh, but however you can use sound you waves because sound waves propagate very fast in uh, water so you can use sound waves to in the same fashion you will uh, emit some sound waves with the help of a transducer that sound waves will travel uh, through the water and they will hit some uh, hostile targets then they will come back to your ship and there are hydrophones placed so that you can sense the uh, sound waves that you had emitted and you can find out the range and direction of the threats below so sonar stands for sound navigation and ranging so uh, yeah, sir, you all must have known the uh, fate of titanic or um, some of you might have even seen the movie uh, as well so why did that ship sink what happened actually was uh, they entirely depended upon visual uh, detection for navigation 
so the lookouts on that particular uh, unfaithful day they were not able to make out any iceberg that was in the course of that ship because of that reason uh, they the ship collided with the iceberg and it sank so uh, just one month after the uh, titanic disaster the first patent was registered for uh, the sonar so sonar again is very similar to radar instead of radio waves it is now using sound waves uh now uh in world war 1 obviously uh, we all think that wars uh, lead to destruction they lead to economical losses they need to damage but there are some positive sides to war as well there have been many such inventions which have been used in the civil world uh, which are a result of war you can uh, cite in numerous number of examples like penicillin uh, internet or uh, canned foods for navigation uh, sonar let us say so these all are a result of inventions due to war so in world war 1 uh, what happened is the concept of subsurface uh, vessels came into existence uh, you would be surprised to know that germany built around it laid down around 1100 submarines uh, during world war 1 and world war 2 so there was a very uh, uh, dire need of making any particular system which could detect where the submarines exactly are we you cannot fire anything in the blind you need to know what is the position of the enemy submarine so for that reason sonars came into existence and uh, during world war 1 they were extensively used so uh, it has been almost a century more than a century since the first use of sonar and they have uh, improved a lot over the period of the last uh, 100 years so now uh, sonars are of various types you can have uh, towed array sonars you can have variable depth sonars but the most common one and the most relevant one which comes uh, which is to be considered during the design of a hull is the uh, bow mounted sonar so you can see a protruding structure in the bottom of this uh, picture so uh, in first view you might think this is a bulbous bow but this is not a bulbous bow uh, the all the hydrophones which are used to listen to the sound waves and all the transducers that generate the sound waves are placed in this structure so you uh, obviously if you are making any change below the uh, surface of the water in your hull you need to optimize it to such a level that the uh, resistance is minimum and uh, the sea keeping uh, of the vessel is not compromised so you cannot just take into consideration only one factor and optimize it to the maximum suppose i take uh, i need a very large area for placing my hydrophones so i cannot make a very large uh, sonar dome obviously it will increase my resistance and it will compromise my sea keeping and if i am looking uh, from a perspective of a naval architect i cannot remove this entire structure because then i will have nothing to place my uh, hydrophones so it is a perfect balance between all these factors uh, so that trade off you have to decide as a, a naval architect while designing a warship so again these structures are not made up of uh, the same material that is used for uh, making the hull uh, because uh, very uh, sensitive fiber reinforced plastic is to be placed here so that you can place your hydrophones for uh, accurate uh, reception of the sound waves so while docking and undocking this has to be kept in mind that you cannot place any dock blocks in the sonar dome because obviously the sonar dome will get crushed so uh, there are some common naval architectural considerations which are more or less similar to the design of a normal uh, conventional vessel so obviously we need to uh, take into consideration the buoyancy and flotation that the uh, ship's hull must provide sufficient buoyancy for uh, carrying all the equipments that we are uh, that we desire to carry uh, the stability of the ship must not be uh, compromised because of all these design factors it must be stable uh, in stable in still water and uh, even in rough seas next uh, the deck area so uh, placing all the weapons uh, on the deck is a very uh, tedious task you need to decide uh, you also have to take into consideration the factor of uh, redundancy you cannot place all your missiles in one single place suppose any uh, hostile projectile comes and hits that particular area then you are not able to operate anything so generally what we do is we divide those things uh, things into two different modules we suppose we are going to carry multiple missiles then we divide them into half and we place them at two different places so uh strength is one more uh factor that we need to uh, uh address because placing such heavy gun mounts uh, missile silos uh, guns torpedo tubes is not a easy task you need to make suitable uh, mountings suitable strengthening structure so that it can withstand the load of impact 
and also the load which is generated during firing of such weapon systems. Sea keeping is again uh, very similar to what uh, that uh, we have for conventional vessels, but there are some weapon systems which we cannot operate at a very uh, rough state, uh, rough sea state. So we need to ensure that our vessel is very uh, stable, is, is having a very uh, stable motion in rough seas as well, so that we can operate our weapons efficiently. Again, uh, propulsive resistance that is very common, uh, similar to what uh, we have for normal conventional vessels. So now uh, the factor I was talking about, stealth is one of the uh, most important factors that comes into play while designing a warship. Uh, obviously, we cannot uh, expect our warship to be uh, visible to the enemy and at the same time we can expect it to be safe from uh, enemy countermeasures. So for that reason, we want to devise uh, such technologies, we want to design our uh, warship in such a manner that it cannot be easily detected by our enemy. So there are various uh, factors of stealth, various domains. So first we'll uh, understand what is uh, stealth. So moving quietly to avoid detection and the art of deception and camouflage is basically stealth. So you don't want yourself to be highlighted in the radars or sonars of the enemy. So there are different signatures which are used to detect the position of a ship. Signature is basically anything that helps your enemy to find out your position and location. So there are different signatures. I will come upon that. So a ship signature can be of various types. Uh, first is visual detection. Obviously, if you see a ship, you will get to know that there is some hostile activity going on. Uh, wake of a ship. Uh, I hope you all are aware what is wake of a ship. Whenever a ship moves in water, in layman terms, there is some disturbance created. Uh, so when the ship moves forward, that disturbance which is created in the aft is known as the wake of the ship. Again, uh, when I'm talking about noise, noise is not the uh, normal noise uh, which generally uh, one will get an idea of. It is the noise of the propeller the noise it is generating underwater because that noise can travel up to several miles. It can go up to 20, 30 miles. So it can be detected from that much distance, the noise your propeller is making. So noise signatures are very important. Again, infrared signatures, uh, we cannot just let our exhaust gases go out untreated uh, because of that infrared homing missiles can find your ship. So you need to cool down your exhaust gases before you release them into the atmosphere. And uh, again, radar, I've already spoken about radar cross section has to be reduced and uh, magnetic. Uh, so magnetic signatures are generated. Uh, suppose we are placing, obviously we are going to place a lot of electrical instruments and systems on board a ship. So they will generate a magnetic field of the ship. So that magnetic field of the ship itself can disturb the magnetic field of earth and any deviation from the normal magnetic field of earth can be detected by magnetic anomaly detection. It can even help you to detect a small piece of metal which is lying in the uh, seabed from uh, from the air. So helicopters can usually use their magnetic anomaly detection devices and they can find out if any shipwreck is there on the uh, ocean of the floor, uh, floor of the ocean. So now uh, visual detection, to avoid visual detection, we need to uh, have certain kind of visual camouflage. So in most of the navies, the warships are painted grayish white. So, uh, however, visual detection is very rare because no two ships are going to come very close to each other uh, as uh, they will detect each other, obviously, when they are in a range of 50 to 60 nautical miles with the help of uh, other signatures. So, this is the uh, photograph of the, uh, of the uh, Indian aircraft carrier, the INS Vikrant. So, you can see the color code that has been used to paint this ship so that even if uh, the possibility is there for visual detection, uh, it is very difficult for someone to find out at a distance that this ship is there at the horizon. So next is a uh, wake. So wake of a ship can be spotted from miles away. Uh, in World War II, during the Battle of Midway, this particular signature led to the destruction of three aircraft carriers of Japan in a single day. Because the American aircraft, they spotted the wake of the Japanese carriers from 12 miles away. So because of that reason only, they lost three aircraft carriers. So you can understand how important this thing is. So wake reduction can be achieved by proper hull design. You have to uh, model your hull in such a manner that it does not leave a great disturbance in the aft of the ship. So you can see uh, this is an aircraft carrier of uh, United States of America. You can see how much wake it is generating while moving forward. So obviously, if a ship is large, its wake is also going to be large. Similarly, you will have to design your hull in such a manner that the wake signatures are very less. So next is radar cross section. This is the most important factor of stealth, uh, uh, I must say, because 
larger hull means more metal surfaces means a greater probability of getting detected by uh, enemy radar so uh, design if you optimize the design of your ship above the uh, water line in such a manner that the incoming radar waves from the hostile ships can be scattered in different directions you have to ensure that the incoming radio waves do not go back to its source then you are able to uh, achieve the factor of stealth by radar uh, in radar cross section so obviously if we are having multiple exposed structures on the deck then we are exposing many multiple number of surfaces so it is giving a greater probability of getting detected by the enemy so it is better that we cover everything up and we make a single structure and we incline it at such an angle that the incoming radio waves are not reflected back to the enemy so uh, this figure depicts how radar actually works you can see that the uh, emission of radio waves from this part is going hitting the metal surface in a perpendicular uh, angle and the entire stuff is coming back so in that in this case the detection will be the maximum uh, it is the easiest to detect any warship if the radio waves are incident on the uh, surface of the metal at the uh, at a 90 degree angle at a perpendicular angle but instead if you incline your sides in such a manner that the incoming radio waves are reflected in other directions and it doesn't go back to the source then you are able to achieve the factor of stealth so there is a graph which depicts how much is the intensity of waves how much energy uh, you can say that uh, what is the reflected energy as compared to the angle of inclination so as you keep on increasing inclination lesser and lesser radio waves are reflected back to radar cross section is reduced so this is in case of single reflection but suppose we are having multiple surfaces and there are two plates uh, as arranged in this uh, diagram so uh, the incident direction of radio waves is uh, illustrated here obviously some part a uh, small fraction of radio waves will go back to the source but uh, the large part uh, almost around 90% of the radio waves will again get reflected from plate a it will go to plate b and again plate b will reflect them back to the source so we need to ensure that such plates such conditions do not arise while designing a, a warship so uh, you can see some warships with uh, very less or very excellent uh, radar stealth uh, capabilities this is the uh, independence class uh, ship of the uh, united states navy you can see there are no uh, surfaces which can probably reflect back the radio waves back to the uh, hostile ship we also have zoom world class destroyers uh, the entire structure is covered and all the uh, surfaces are inclined in such a manner that the radio waves incoming radio waves are scattered in different directions so again uh, coming to noise uh, we need to design our propeller in such a manner that the uh, noise of the propeller is minimum now if we go on optimizing this single thing then it might happen that uh, the propulsive the propulsive efficiency will decrease so uh, it is a perfect trade off that the naval architect has to decide upon what is the perfect propeller uh, it is a very debatable topic because you need to design a propeller which is having the least noise and the maximum propulsive efficiency again there are uh, machinery on board normal uh, diesel uh, engines uh, gas turbines diesel generators and other machineries which generate a lot of vibrations so we need to ensure that those vibrations are not transferred into the water those vibrations need to be dampened with the help of suitable mountings made up of rubber and different structures so uh, reducing noise is another important factor the uh, entire ships need uh, entire ship needs to be magnetically neutral so even if we are placing electrical systems on board we need to ensure that the magnetic signature of the ship is minimum so uh, infrared i've already uh, covered in the first slide that uh, we need to cool down the exhaust of the vessel so that uh, infrared detection cannot find the location of our ship now coming to propulsion uh, warships do not operate at discrete speeds like merchant vessels the concept of cruising is very much restricted in warships sometimes they need to speed uh, sprint some sometimes they might have to operate at very low speeds for operating their sonar sometimes they have to cruise from for getting from point a to point b so we have to keep on varying the speeds uh, from uh, zero to the maximum speed so we cannot have a single uh, prime mover we cannot have uh, 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 what do i say a uh, optimum uh, operating speed we cannot have for our warship so for different scenarios we need different speeds 
so for that particular reason uh, warships need to operate at low speeds for uh, prolonged periods for operating sonars and they need to sprint uh, to escape hostile territory to avoid detection and even to chase hostile targets so because of these reasons a single propulsion plant is not enough for these varied domain of operations and a combination of various prime movers like gas turbines diesel engines sometimes even nuclear propulsion uh, can be used for obtaining uh, these varied domains of speed obviously these different prime movers are coupled via gearboxes and uh, here is a cut section of a gas turbine and uh, we also have uh, a diesel engine gas turbines are getting very popular nowadays because of uh, their uh, they can be used over a, a range of uh, suppose my uh, ship's maximum speed is 30 knots and uh, i have to cruise at 18 knots so i can have two sets of two uh, gas turbines which can operate uh, with the help of a when we couple them with the help of a gearbox and we can achieve both these uh, speeds with the help of gas turbines itself so uh, safety of course we have certain rules laid down for normal conventional vessels like safety of life at sea and uh, other uh, classification rules also but for a ship a warship must put itself in the line of danger and the probability of getting a damage is uh, greater so for that reason we need to design our vessel in such a manner that uh, for countering such uh, nuclear biological chemical and uh, uh, such damages we need some uh, systems to be fitted on board and are designed to be optimized in such a manner that we can counter such uh, damages uh, efficiently so safety measures are very uh, like they are more sophisticated as compared to normal vessels and uh, special compartments need more attention to fire and flooding control because obviously if you are going to carry a lot of missiles and ammunition those compartments are very prone to uh, damage via fire so you need to install additional uh, fire control systems uh, sometimes even uh, halogen fire control systems so that you can counter those uh, damages if they occur so nbcd stands for nuclear biological chemical and uh, damage control so uh, citadel capable ships are ships which can enter into a nuclear fallout area or any zone which has been affected by a biological weapon and still the crew inside the ship is safe so you need to install certain air filtration units air treatment units uh, which can ensure that the air inside the ship is uh, purified and uh, circulated so that there is no need of taking air from outside so there have been a lot of inventions in the maritime domain uh, which were a result of war i must say so both the world wars saw rapid advancements in technology uh, some of the inventions are still in use after substantial improvements uh, like i mentioned radars and sonars both are the gift of uh, world wars only uh, the concept of submerged vessels were uh, developed by the european navies it was invented by france but germany mastered it during world war 2 and uh, the concept of aircraft carriers changed the domain of naval warfare from conventional cannons to aerial strikes now nowadays uh, you won't find any warships with large 18 inch or 16 inch cannons you will have uh, uh, missiles cruise missiles and uh, you are having uh, air strikes so aircraft carriers are obviously having uh, fighter jets which can carry uh, anti ship missiles and uh, they can fire upon them so the domain of warfare has changed over the period of uh, last 100 years so again uh, earlier we used to uh, have riveting as the uh, most common joining technique but during the war uh, they all shifted to welding and uh, stabilizers obviously we need stabilizers so that we can control the motions of our ship so that we can uh, use our weapon systems efficiently for targeting and other purposes uh, steel hulls became very prominent uh, in the late 18th and 19th centuries the ships warships were made out of wood but since the technology advanced we uh, developed steel hulls uh, uh, sonar and radar have already covered so these are some of the inventions uh, because of uh, war in the maritime domain now uh, this is a very debatable topic a very uh, big question that what is the perfect trade off because uh, looking from the perspective of a normal naval architecture you would be aiming to optimize the common uh, aspects like sea keeping propulsion resistance etc but looking at the perspective of a warship designer or from the perspective of the user who is going to operate the ship you will demand more deck space you will demand more weaponry you will demand more more and more sensors so what is the perfect trade off between those two is a very important question so numerous factors from different domains are taken into consideration and uh, an unbiased perfect balance is to be struck between all the factors in the design phase itself 
so there is a practice commonly uh, followed in the navy during uh, the design of warships uh, in which user interactive groups are formed uh, before the design of a warship is laid so existing crew members from existing warships are taken and they are brought to the drawing table so where naval architects can put forward their design and they will give their feedback that what they need as a user that what they desire in the vessel so then a perfect balance is struck between the ideas of the naval architect and the user and uh, optimal design is suggested so uh, again i have already reiterated this many times that we uh, sh should avoid it is to be avoided over optimization is to be avoided we cannot just take into uh, consideration a single factor and optimize it to the maximum a perfect balance is to be uh, found between the two so finally we will conclude with what we have learned uh, as a part of this uh, webinar because it might come useful to you uh, in uh, civil world also so apart from the technical aspects uh, we have to stay in harmony with the latest technology in case of warships the technology advances at a very fast rate you design a warship you construct it today within uh, you uh, design it for uh, uh, operating for 30 years but after launching the ship after 5 years the weapon systems will change so you need to make certain uh, considerations so that in case any change happens you are able to incorporate that thing in your ship without uh, much uh, damage uh, next up is uh, cross check with user interactive groups which i just spoke about right now uh, during design you have to uh, look from the perspective of a user that how that particular uh, uh, suppose you are placing any hatch cover or any smallest uh, uh, hatch or any particular thing in your ship how is it going to affect the user you must know you must interact with them if you are not a uh, seafarer you must interact with users who are existing who are using uh, who have already uh, spent some time on board so that you can get a perspective of a user and you can optimize your design accordingly obviously for warships uh, human comfort is placed uh, in the least priority so still as a warship uh, designer you need to consider into uh, you need to take into consideration the uh, safety and comfort of the uh, crew on board so uh, those are some factors that you need to consider you need to look forward to the future leave scope for improvement and you have to find the perfect trade off you should not over optimize any particular thing so this is what i appreciated for uh, from my opinion uh, that should be uh, given to you as a beginner's perspective for warship design so that's all from my side uh, i would be i would encourage any questions if you have i would be happy to answer them thank you Yes. Okay, okay. Hello. My name is Krishna Kumar. Okay. I'm 37 batch. Uh, my question about that topic, the new invention which comes, how do you incorporate in the uh the uh, ongoing vessels or uh, ongoing ongoing aircraft? Is there uh, Okay. So one
Uh, is it uh, what info information we can that uh, how much one missile is the Brahmos info just share hello information is very for the missile system for those particular missiles like Like solid uh, fuels for huh? Hmm. Where are you? Where are you? With respect to the new caution zones, emissions, and all, uh, how does warship? technology generally uh, fit into it do they have to uh, follow the regulations and also as uh, as uh, something like a what um, aircraft carrier is huge what could be the role of fitting something like an alternative propulsion system like uh, nuclear you know uh, how does it play how does it roll for especially in the context of india so how how do, how, how can we adapt to it Okay, so uh, taking the example of nuclear propulsion system. So currently there are only two navies in the world which use uh, nuclear powered aircraft carriers. So once you have installed a nuclear propulsion plant for the entire service life of that aircraft carrier, you do not need to refuel those reactors. One small piece of radioactive material is enough to run that ship for the entire course of uh, 25 to 30 years. So if you are going for nuclear propulsion, you cannot make any changes. If you are, if you have already built or uh, designed a vessel for normal conventional propulsion, then it is very difficult for you to incorporate a nuclear reactor because you have to cut through so many decks. You have to remove that existing uh, propulsion system and install a nuclear reactor. So that is very difficult task to do. So we not that is not economically feasible. So obviously, if we are having a nuclear reactor, we'll go for designing or building a new ship rather than installing that nuclear reactor in a ship because obviously that ship has served some 10 to 15 years already in service. So most of the systems of those ship are already obsolete. So there is no point of installing a nuclear reactor in an existing ship. So in case any new technology comes up and it is very radically uh, different from the existing technologies, we generally go for designing new vessels rather than including in the, uh, in the existing vessels. So uh, for nuclear reactors, it is like that. Only France and... Uh, uh, USA are having nuclear powered aircraft carriers till now. Uh, even India was not having its own nuclear reactor. Uh, after a lot of uh, hard work and uh, efforts, we got some nuclear reactors for uh, installing them on board our nuclear powered uh, uh, ballistic missile submarines. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks, Sanvish. Thank you. So, I hope if nobody else is having any queries, we can wrap up this session. I uh, intended to give you a short introduction, a short brief on how warship design is approached, how, what are all the factors that you need to consider before starting warship design. So I am no master at warship design. That's just a uh, uh, opinion. What I got from my experience, uh, from reading various uh, sources. So I hope it was a very, uh, kind of, uh, interesting session for you so that you can take up there is a one question in the okay. chat box. Uh, what extra features are put in place to ensure that warships did not sink? Okay, so uh, obviously, uh, normal vessels, we have a compartment standard. I hope you all are aware what compartment standards are. So a uh, warship is prone to damage uh, via the impact of missiles, by the impact of rockets, by the impact of torpedoes. So the uh, subdivision of compartments in a warship is much more elaborate than uh, compared to normal vessels. Suppose flooding starts in any uh, vessel, we are having uh, certain teams already designated for every day there is a duty watch. So they are assigned 
uh, they have their tasks cut out. They are having uh, damage control measures with them. So if any, in the advent of any damage that takes place in the ship, they are having their uh, pumps to throw out the water. Uh, they know when to react, how to react, which all compartments they are going to seal off. And there are uh, monitoring systems throughout the ship. So there is a damage control headquarter somewhere near to the bridge. So in that headquarter, you can easily find out which all uh, compartments are, uh, they are intact. They have not lost their watertight integrity. And in, in case any damage comes up, you can easily close off all the hatches and you can use uh, centralized firefighting systems or uh, deflooding systems from the damage control headquarters itself. So uh, that is all the arrangements that we can have uh, on board ships. Uh, if you go on board a warship, if you happen to go on board a warship, you can easily find out multiple firefighting systems placed at very regular intervals. You have fire mains, you have portable firefighting systems, you have uh, halogen based firefighting systems as well for certain compartments, for magazine compartments and all. So uh, for with the help of these measures, we can make sure that uh, warships do not sink. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Hmm. ரமேஷ் பாண்டே டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் டெக்னாலஜி நம்பர் 